Happy to be joined by the voice of the Octagon, John Anik, who just called uh, the last pay-per-view of the year, UFC 296. We've got a lot to talk about there. But John, first, how are you? Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. It's always good to have a few minutes to uh, chop it up. It's nice to be outside the other side of UFC 296. And uh, these fight weeks always bring something unexpected. So it was a great year and uh, happy to uh, talk about it a little bit with you today, my man. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of unexpected, just kind of looking back as, on the year as a whole, do you remember this many big fights kind of changing hands? Uh, you know, you look at Strickland uh, defeating Adesanya. You had obviously Sean O'Malley uh, defeating Sterling. You had Alexa Grasso with her submission went over Valentina Shushenko. I know we've had upsets in the past, but it seems like this year was just like another level. This year was wild. It sort of made me want to, and perhaps this sounds like copping out, not do an award show on the Anakin Florian podcast. When I started listing the knockouts, there were 27 of them. And Derek Lewis's knockout of Pezal that began with that sort of jumping switch knee at the beginning of the fight, nobody's listing that as their knockout of the year. I mean, it just speaks to the embarrassment of riches. That was the year for the UFC and, and for, I think, MMA as a whole. And uh, yeah, it's hard to pare it down. It's hard to sort of pit one champion against another when it comes to the fighter of the year conversation. But uh, it was a great year, a memorable year. Uh, it's the it's truly in all of professional sports. I mean, I hope this doesn't sound hyperbolic, but it is the the land of the unpredictable, man. It truly is. And I'm thankful that I'm contractually prevented from betting on this stuff because I think I would be ripping up a lot of tickets. Yeah, no, it certainly was a tough year for for betters, unless you're on the other side and you're you're picking a lot of underdogs. Uh, let's talk about UFC 296. You were there. You were in the main event. A uh, bit of a bizarre performance from, I think, to say it lightly, with with Colby Covington. Uh, what did you make at the time? You're calling this fight, and we're seeing Colby very passive. Reminding me a bit of the Francis Ngannou and 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 um, and obviously Derek Lewis fight from a couple of years ago. What's going through your head? What are you thinking as Colby very hesitant in there against Leon Edwards? Well, I would always defer to the analyst. Dominic Cruz is very dismissive of ring rust. And you have to sift through the misinformation with Colby Covington. If there was one thing you could extract from his post-fight interview with Joe Rogan, maybe it was that there was some ring rust from the inactivity, which had dated to March of 2022. But Dominic Cruz suggested maybe there was an injury or something. I just feel like, James, this was such an outlier to Colby Covington's career. But when I talk to these smarter heads like Kenny Florian, they tell me that all credit to Leon Edwards, right? For the range, for the precision, for just the way he is able to, uh, you know, make guys not look very good. I mean, perhaps you want to criticize Leon for not taking more risks, but he won the first four rounds going away. So I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I was put off by the visual at the end of round five with him fighting off of his back as some other people. I mean, he certainly has proven to have some more wrinkles to his game as far as the wrestling and the grappling were concerned. He has muscles coming out of his back that weren't there before he was in the best shape of his life as far as strength and conditioning is concerned. And that is one thing that Leon acknowledged with, with us in the fighter meeting. When you fight Colby Covington, it, it's a little bit of a mind bend. You have to come in in the best shape of your life. And he did that. And he fought a style that night in which he could have gone 10 rounds. But on the Covington side, uh, Dana said he looks slow and old. I could certainly lean into that respectfully, right? I don't mm -hmm. know what to say about Colby, but I think you really got to give credit to Leon, no? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, I think the, the pressure from Leon as well made it through, may have thrown uh, Colby off a little bit too. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. Just very, like you said, unusual for, for Colby Covington not being the, the aggressor uh, in a fight. Um, I know you've been vocal about this on Twitter. I think the majority of fans agree. Uh, I think a lot of us are surprised that Leon Edwards is not calling for Bilal Muhammad next. And it seems like you know, I know there was a, an interview that kind of got a bit taken out of context yesterday uh, with Leon's coach talking about, um, you know, maybe Gilbert Burns next. I think he was asked his preference. But even then, um, how surprised are you that there isn't a de definite, you know, sort of answer from Leon saying, yeah, Bilal's got to be next? Well, I'm not necessarily surprised. It's not Leon Edwards' job as the undisputed UFC welterweight champion to lay the foundation for his next title defense. Certainly, if his aspiration is to go down as the greatest welterweight champion of all time, and by the way, that is well within reach when you just be Kamar Usman twice and then Colby Covington, if that's the goal, he should want to take out and beat all of these guys. And I think you need to marry, James, the financial goals with the career aspirational goals to be, I mean, he's a Hall of Famer first ballot, but to go down as potentially the greatest welterweight of all time, if Bilal Muhammad is indeed easy work, I think that fight makes a lot of sense. And when you look divisionally at some of these guys who have ironclad cases, may Rob Dwalish Willie comes to mind. Of course, he vaulted to number one contender status in and around the time where his teammate Al Jermaine Sterling was the champion, right? Kamzat Shimaev is the only man who can lay claim to a welterweight title shot right now, as far as I'm concerned, other than Bilal Muhammad, and he's not competing in the weight class, right? 
Bilal yeah. has one of these unbeaten streaks like all of the champions do, and he doesn't get any pound for pound consideration. I just think that we have to restore a little bit of order. And uh, I do think the UFC is going to make the right decision here. What I do find interesting, James, is that Ramadan starts in early March and ends April 8th or 9th during fight week for UFC 300, right? So that would certainly be less than ideal for Bilal Muhammad. But if we're really worried about Bilal moving the pay-per-view needle and selling the fight, and by the way, reference the Sean Brady fight if he's not entertaining, but if people don't think Bilal can sell the fight, it's very frustrating for me, James, right? Like that yeah. our pro sport is the one where you have to entertain and need style points. But if they don't think he can sell the fight, then make him do his whole training camp during Ramadan and fight him at UFC 300 on April 13th, yeah. you know, and you can be one of two or three title fights and then everybody makes money and everybody's happy. He's the rightful number one contender. And I don't get on whatever platform I have because my twin brother hosts a podcast with him. There are myriad number one contender types who I've gone to bat for in the past. Brandon yeah. Roy ball being one of them, right? Like, I, I'm a professional mixed martial arts fan, and sometimes I don't keep my mouth shut, perhaps against my better judgment. But this case seems to be one that I, uh, that I have to try to promote because what are we doing here, Jimmy? What are we doing? I know, I know, I, I, I don't get it either. It's, it's a little bit confusing. I guess the one name we should mention as well that you know people are saying that you know maybe there is is a chance for a title shot here is, is Shavkat Rachmanov, obviously finishing Stephen Thompson. Uh, you know the first fighter to submit uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson as he did so on the weekend. Although that was kind of expected if you looked at the odds going in about him winning that fight. Uh, what do you make of Shavkat and his placement? Do you think there's a possibility of him waiting out for maybe the winner of Bilal and Leon, or do you think he should? fight someone next what, what sort of your thought thoughts on that Shavkat Rachmanov is the man one of my favorite fighters 18 and 0 with 18 finishes went into this fight with an injured ankle so he's on the mend a little bit that's true I too. think he has about half as many UFC wins as Bilal Muhammad and Shavkat Rachmanov was one of the guys who was talking about a meritocracy and putting Bilal Muhammad's name out there right I think he's close right and maybe because he has those finishes he's the promotions cup of tea right now um but, you know, I do believe that Bilal Muhammad's resume puts him in a position where Shavkat is just not quite there yet. But it's not my job to make fights. And that's why if you look at the way I tweet about this stuff, uh, I hope people realize I'm very careful with the language, right? I mean, Leon Edwards and I are forever intertwined and connected. And I love Team Edwards. You know, I just... Uh, I just feel like Bilal's case, man. It's like we got to reward these athletes for doing everything right over a period of time because if we don't do that, then then what are we doing here? Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, just the last thing from UFC 296, obviously Patty Pimblett defeating Tony Ferguson. Um, there's a lot of questions as to what is next for Patty. Does he get that ranked opponent? I think a lot of people have mentioned Bobby Green is maybe an option there. Green coming off a pretty brutal ref stoppage, if we're being honest here. I think, don't think that's a crazy take or anything. But uh, what, what would you like to see next for Patty? I think, you know, with this win streak, it's probably due for a ranked opponent. Well, so without giving you a particular name, I would suggest to you that there are guys in the top 15 that Patty Pimblett could beat right now, and maybe there are guys in the top 30, 35 that could beat Patty Pimblett. The jury's still out. I don't yeah. think people are anointing him a top 15 talent necessarily, but a lot of the tools are there, right? He got to the UFC at the right time, could have come here earlier on two occasions, came at the right time, has an appetite for training and strength and conditioning, even if, you know, sometimes he he likes to eat like some of the rest of us in between fights. I do believe in a broad sense, if you are going to be a world champion, you got to sort of minimize that part of things and recreationally check things and really be on a trajectory that's going to put you in line with every decision to be a world champion. But I thought it was a masterful week for, for Patty Pimblett. He's outstanding on the microphone. I thought he really shined at the press conference, you know, when he calls people a a knit, you know, or a sausage. He's, he's really easy to listen to. He doesn't pre-write any of his material. Uh, and I do think if you go at Patty Pimblett and fighters aren't getting drowned out by the crowd, uh, he has a lot of ability on a microphone to sort of put people in their place and, uh, really shine in that realm. But yeah, I think he's a really good fighter. He's a really good grappler, right? It's not that easy to get a second degree on your Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, but there's a lot of improvement to be made. Justin Flores and a lot of the right coaches are uh, are in his ear. So I'm uh, I'm ambitious for Patty Pimblett's chances. Uh, top 15, yeah, if it's the right matchup, I think, uh, I think sign me up. Is this the end for Tony Ferguson? I know he still wants to fight, but at some point you gotta you gotta win fights, and and it didn't, that fight on Saturday didn't really look that competitive. 
Oh, man, you know, I try not to be in the business of retiring fighters and Tony Ferguson. As long as he gets in the Hall of Fame, I really don't care, right? And uh, right, I yeah. think that will be the, uh, again, and that would be something that maybe people would say, oh, be careful, John, you know, you know, promoting people's causes or whatever. But no, as long as Tony gets in into the Hall of Fame, James, I don't really necessarily care. How many lightweights are on the roster, right? Are there 80 of them? And, uh, you know, maybe strategically there's a matchup where you feel like he couldn't get hurt. You know, he's able to go the distance with Patty Pimblett, right? I'm not saying that he's looking for that type of moral victory. Um, I guess I would just like to see him, you know, have some sort of shining moment, even if it's like grappling on UFC Fight Pass, right? I just would like to see the guy smile and have his hand raised. But, um, you know, it's really tricky, James. The the mixed martial arts landscape, the combat sports landscape, oftentimes you make a lot of money uh, at a stage of your career when you're not in your prime or at your best. And uh, not suggesting that Tony's show money right now is otherworldly or better than it has been at any stage of his career, but you know what I'm talking about, right? It's really difficult when people come at you at a certain stage of your career. You know, if he does leave the UFC, right, you know, who's going to be dangling carrots. So um, I just I just really hope that Tony has his body of work acknowledged as the first UFC lightweight to put a double-digit winning streak on paper, the 12 successive wins, and uh, the circumstances that prevented him from fighting for the undisputed title are really sad. But uh, first ballot Hall of Famer for me, and uh, I'll be championing that cause until I am out of air. I, I'm, I'm with you on that cause for sure. Uh, next year, obviously, we already got a bunch of fights booked that, that are coming up. Uh, how much more interesting is uh, Sean Strickland and, and Drekus Duplessis, uh, you know, for UFC 297 after everything happened last week? In some ways, I feel like that overshadowed a lot of what happened last week. Well, I kind of want to spin that question back to you because I was yeah. so bullish about that main event and its ability to entertain beforehand that I'm not sure as an MMA fan, it really feels heightened to me. Yeah, I mean, it's cool to have and uh obviously we re repurposed the video it'll be interesting the extent to which they lean into that leading up to the fight uh but these guys are both great on a microphone you know one thing that drake is duplessis is is a truth teller and i do believe and a lot of public figures feel this way that you're perpetually misunderstood and i really feel like drake is misunderstood he's a really good guy just wants to be a world champion you know that's why he didn't yeah. rush into a fight against israel adesanya so excited to see what he can do and uh yeah, man, Sean Strickland's hard not to like. I got to be honest with you. You know, sometimes there are some wayward things that come out of his mouth. But, um, you know, there are a lot of very intellectual Australian MMA fans, and they can't help but be drawn into this guy. And it's not just because they maybe loathe Israel Adesanya for beating Robert Whitaker, right? Sean Strickland's got something about him, man, you know? Uh, and any of us who have ever been, you know, thought of as a dick, right? Like in my family, sometimes it seems like I'm the asshole, James, even though I don't <laughs> appear to be that guy. Okay. So for Sean Strickland, I I don't know. I just sometimes I like his vibe a little bit, and I'm really excited to get to Toronto and, to Toronto and see what these guys can uh, muster up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one for sure. Um, what was your biggest highlight this past year, whether it's something you watched or a fight you called? Is there anything that sort of stands out? I know that's a very general question I'm throwing to you at the last minute here, but just looking back on this year, what what are some what are some things that really stood out to you? I think the year will be remembered for Alexa Grasso, and then as crazy as it may sound, Noche UFC. For someone like me who cut my teeth in combat sports as a boxing radio journalist, I loved Mexico. At a time, I almost got a Mexican flag tattooed on my body. Marco Antonio Barrera is the man, right? So to finally see after this long-term commitment from the UFC, Sean Shelby and so many other individuals to reap the reward, so to speak, and have these Mexican champions break through and then to build an event around that country and Mexican Independence Day and Noche UFC that in all likelihood is going to be a pay-per-view inside the goddamn sphere Las Vegas next year. For me, 2023 has to be the year of Mexico and the UFC and the year of Alexa Grasso and, uh, you know, only followed up with a, another competitive performance against the consensus, you know, one or one a greatest of all time, Valentina Shevchenko. So that's the biggest takeaway for me. Johnny Bones and Tommy Aspen all a close second. But uh, yeah, the year of Alexa Grasso, Francisco Grasso, my coach of the year for uh, 2023. What are your plans for the holidays? You, get, you getting any time off when we were actually booking this? I know you're doing some other stuff. I don't know if you want to reveal that, but uh, like, like it seems like, uh, you know, again, we don't get much of a break with this sport, right? Because uh, obviously it's a year round sport. Yeah. So I thought I was done voicing EA Sports UFC five. We were not. Now we are. <laughs> so we did. I did the final eight hours without Daniel Cormier uh, on Monday and Tuesday. We also filmed the 2023 UFC year in review on Sunday. So it's been a lot of talking. I will always carve out some time for James Lynch. And I'm very happy for your career success. But it was literally, bro, Saturday pay-per-view post-fight show, Sunday year in review, Monday, Tuesday, EA Sports, uh, NFL podcast yesterday, James Lynch Thursday. But yes, we're almost out the other side. And, um, you know, we'll find out if Santa Claus is real here on the 25th. Any favorite Christmas movies? Do you have any traditions you do every year? 
Oh, Elf, dude. I mean, Elf. I hope that isn't so mainstream an answer. But uh, Home Alone, finally, my daughters are old enough to watch that one. So, uh, yeah. My son, you know, he's like, Daddy, am I Jewish? I'm like, yeah, you know, your dad's 100% Jewish. You know, he's like, I don't like Hanukkah. I'm like, come on, man. You know, he's fine. <laughs> Give me something like, here. On, yeah, bro. for, for no, sure. It's all about uh, getting. God asks as a Canadian, are you watching the Bruins at all this year? Are you watching watching any hockey? So I'm a big box score guy. I'm betting on the NHL every day. I just placed a $300 bet on the Toronto Maple Leafs to win the Eastern Conference. I, when I was Oh, Eastern Conference. Game. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, I very rarely do I bet to win Stanley Cup or to win Super Bowl. It's always to get to the Final Four. But uh, yeah, I got a Maple Leafs ticket. You know, we'll see what happens there. Uh, I got a soft spot for the Maple Leafs, man. I want, you know, I just, I don't know. I'm softening in my old age. But yeah, no, I'm following the Bruins. I, you know, they'll be right there. It's just the hardest pro sports championship to win. So I, I, sometimes it's hard to be super uh, excited, you know, that that they can really get it done. But uh, you win a playoff series, anything can happen. And uh, obviously it's been a pretty good regular season so far. So, well, and I'm a Canucks fan and I think uh, we're sort of giving you guys a run for your money as far as the best goaltending duo in the NHL. You guys have obviously Swayman and, uh, and Ulrich and we've got uh, Casey DeSmith and Demko. They've been playing lights out. So it's been a fun year for, for me anyways, because usually it's a lot of misery as a Canucks fan. Yeah. So. so the man who sits to my left on pay-per-view nights, his name is Craig Niner Conley, right? He has been in that seat since the year 2000. So 23 years with the UFC, one of his best friends in the world, Rick Tockett. So, uh, oh, love it. We got a love Vancouver it. connection. If, uh, if you ever need any tickets, Niner Conley's your guy. So, that, that's good to know. And uh, Tockett, uh, I believe, a resident of Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that's where yeah. he lives in the office. Yeah, he so, was at one go. point in time. Yep. Yeah, he was at the last UFC too, which is great. Uh, John, we've gone way over time. Thank you so much for doing this. Happy holidays. Uh, if there's anything you want to mention, we got the Anakin Florian you mentioned year in review. Uh, anything you got going on there, any of the EA stuff, I'll give you the last word, my friend. Well, thank you, buddy. Anakin Florian podcast twice a week on the DraftKings YouTube channel. Thanks in advance for navigating YouTube and finding that. You can just search Anakin Florian podcast. And uh, yeah, we begin our two-part award show on uh, January 1st.